Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a much-anticipated guest this week. He gets mentioned nearly every week on the show in some context. He is a well-known trainer um, of Sam Shanklin and many other secret top players. He's a uh, prolific and acclaimed author. Uh, he, of course, is a grandmaster and a chess player. He's been the British champion and the Scottish chess champion. He's trained uh, Olympiad teams, and he is the co-founder of Quality Chess Publishing. And he, right here, right now, is going to set the record straight on how I should be pronouncing his name. So I've been saying Jakob Agard, but uh, your actual name is, sir? Jakob Ogard. Jakob Ogard. How was that? I was close. Okay. I'll, close, you, I will you, accept. <laughs> well, thank you. You, you, you forgot ahead. two things in your introduction. Okay. Not, not because I'm not flattered already. Um, but I've also been what we uh, together uh, call half a coach for Boris Gelfand since 2009. And, uh, of course, now I am recently was uh, convicted as a chairman uh, of the Fides Trainers Commission. Okay. Yeah, the Fidius Trader Commission Trainers Commission was in my notes, but I actually didn't know uh how formal your relationship with with uh GM Gelfand was. So was that uh would you say that's your 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 biggest distinction? Well, someone uh, almost becoming world champion is uh is worth including on your CV. Yes, I that's a that's a valid point. Um so Thanks for joining us. We have so much to talk about. And you mentioned in an email that you're excited to, to help people improve on their chess, which obviously, who, who could be more qualified than you to do that? And listeners will oh, get lots to of people, lots of people. <laughs> you're too modest. Um, so listeners will get to that. And of course, there'll be uh, timestamps in the show description. But I mean, I think uh, everything that Mr. Oh, God, how'd I do? Better. Better, okay. Uh, we'll have to say we'll be of interest, but I want to start with your publishing house, Quality Chess. Um, you, along with uh, GM John Shaw, and I am Ari Ziegler, founded it, I believe, in 2003. Um, so 2004. 2004. You had first of April, not to be, uh, to be too modest about it. No, it's, it's, an a, a, it's an April joke that we haven't really gotten over yet. Well, it's a joke that the, the chess world is grateful for. Um, so many quality books. And in addition to your own books, of course, the other books, uh, many of your other um, authors in your stable have had their books recommended here on this show. Um, so you mentioned in Thinking Inside the Box, your most recent book, I, although I know you've got other projects in the works, that you had the idea for Quality Chess in 2003. So uh, what was your initial idea for this uh, company? Well, it, it's uh, as with many things, there was a lot of things that collided at the same time. Um, I was already at this point starting to work on what became the attacking manual. And I was not happy to give it to uh, to every man uh, who I was working for at the time. And actually, I was producing about 35% of the catalog, uh, either as an author or as an editor. And uh, I felt that the final product was not what I wanted. Um, everyone have their own philosophy behind their business and I had, you know, many great years with every man. I was there uh, working for them for, for five, six years. And I have no, no ill feeling towards them. They were really, really nice when we worked together. And they were really nice uh, when I decided to uh, do my own thing. And, uh, you know, I, I I've still have, we still have a very good relationship uh, with them. And uh, at times we exchange opinions on, you know, distribution, uh, stuff like that, all of the legal stuff. We never coordinate prices or anything like this, which you're not allowed to. Um, but I, I felt I wanted to do my own thing. And also I had realized that um, writing chess books uh, was not something that I did to fund playing chess tournaments anymore. Uh, it had become 
I was playing chess tournaments, I had something to write about when I was doing chess books. And I realized if I wanted to to actually pursue doing this, not because it was a choice, but more because, uh, you know, life uh, forced me down this direction, I wanted to do it really well. And to do it really well meant to do it the way I wanted to do. So I wanted to have control. So based on the the setup of Gambit, of three people with uh, different talents uh, working together, uh, we created uh, Quality Chess. And for four years, uh, there were three of us. And from then on, there was uh, two and later on some employees. And when you thought of doing it, did you think of uh, your co-founders right away as potential partners in crime? I, I thought of Ari uh, quite quickly, yes. Um, and... Uh, at the time, it was was the right decision, um, and uh, John was suggested uh, to me by uh, a mutual friend in Scotland, uh, Donald Holmes, uh, who is. Uh, he, I'm I'm in Scotland because I knew Donald and came to visit him, and eventually I never went home. <laughs> um, and and he mentioned John to me, and I had known John since uh, 96, 97, where we played two games. But beyond that, we we hadn't. I don't think we'd met each other since then. Uh, so uh, early 2004, I flew to Scotland, uh, organizing uh, where I would stay, and uh, and met up with John at Central Station and had tea for an hour, and he decided to joined the project and uh, and then I went home the next day um, to Denmark and then three months later I moved to Scotland um, so uh, you know for I think for both John and myself it was uh, one of the great gifts of life to uh, to be able to to work t- together and um, you know he's been the most supportive person uh, in my life the the last 15 years for sure and maybe in my life overall Um, so I I cannot say enough uh, good things about him and what most people don't know about quality chess is that John is the boss and uh, we are 50-50 partners but uh, you cannot have uh, things that are undecided all the time Uh, and in the end, the p- person with power will make the decisions. And I decided, since I do a lot of other things, that it had to be John. And uh, for the last five, six years, he's been the boss. And he does that uh, quite well, I think. Um, and that's how it all came about. Yeah, quality. He does do it quite well based on the product that, that you guys are putting out. I mean, uh Every book is is well presented, and the the I mean, you I do feel like you you guys along with um one or two other companies have raised raised the bar of um of what's possible with chess books. So, do you mind um ex- uh, going into a little more detail about what what you had in mind, what you envisioned when you um, wanted to start your own company? Was there something specific other than I'm sure some some editorial issues in terms of uh, um, controlling the content? Was there anything else in particular that you wanted to to change about uh, the way that the books were published? No, uh, not in terms of how books were published. Uh, for me, it was about what is the objective? And uh, for most chess publishers, uh, and I hope I'm not insulting anyone here, um, but for most of them, uh, making a profit is a very uh, high a priority or maybe the number one priority. Uh, of course, it's a necessity, but uh, there are some people who, uh, some publishers who will publish books which they don't like. Uh, because and start projects which they have no enjoyment from simply because they think it will make money and I will not say that we haven't tried to do that we have tried to do it exactly once and after that we decided that that's not how we want to live our lives Um, so we have a different philosophy which is we're trying to do something that it doesn't already exist and People are asking always, you know, can you really write that many books about chess? And the answer is obviously yes. Uh, I think we constantly find things that haven't been done very well or 
or are simply missing uh, in the market, things that can be done much better. Um, and the, the idea was in the name, uh, which actually I have to say, the name comes from my thoughts uh, and observation about uh, a political party in Denmark, which is uh, very, very right wing, who like uh, all nationalists call themselves by the country. So it's the Danish People's Party. And uh, it's uh, it was always uh, felt to me like why would the other peop- parties accept that someone would you know wrap themselves in the flag like this? Why would they refer to them in this way? But they just did. So I thought, okay, in that case, we'll be quality chess books because if people refer to us, they will say we're good while we right. really talk about us. I know it's cheap, but it it works. No. Yeah, well, I mean, you guys have backed it up, so so <laughs> that helps. Oh yeah, that, that was that was the plan as well. Yeah. Um, so when you have the idea, I, you've you'd already had some experience writing books, probably doing some editing. But how much experience did the three of you have in terms of everything else that goes into to creating a, a publishing house? Well, Ari um, Ari had a, a chess bookshop, and John had written uh, two books, and also he's got a degree in economics. Um, John started out being the editor, Ari was the, the businessman, and I was uh, producing stuff and, and uh, proofreading and s- some other things. And once Ari left, I took over the business side and I also took out over the layout. And uh, I, I, I thank you for your, your nice comment about how books are presented. I still do the layout uh, on the books and most of the cover ideas uh, come from me, even though the, we, have, uh, we work with artists. Um, I'm not saying the other guys are not contributing with a, with a lot of uh, things as well, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of the, the visual stuff. Um, and how much do you enjoy that aspect of your work as compared to all of the um, chess training and writing that you do? Um, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's uh, so stressless. Huh. Um, you know, I'm, uh, at the moment, I'm uh, typesetting a book by Kortov uh, in our classic series. And uh, I'm watching, or I have to say, uh, re-watching Altered Carbon uh, on Netflix at the same time. I have a two screens set up in hmm. my, my office. And uh, that gives me a chance to... Uh, uh, to sit and doing symbol uh, decisions, you know, just fiddling with, with things at the same time as uh, sort of following it uh, out of the corner of my eye. What was it that you said you're watching on Netflix? Altered Carbon. I'm not familiar with that. What, what it's, is it? a, it's a sci-fi series uh, many hundred of years into the future and it's probably the best thing we've seen on on Netflix the last few years. Wow, that, that's a high praise. Yeah, that, well, there's also a lot of, of junk there. But uh, that and there was the German series Dark, uh, which we quite enjoyed as well. It's subtitled, of course. Um, and um, I can't really remember what it was, but the, the ones with the kids investigating who had drawn dicks on all the cars in the high school, <laughs> I really loved that one. <laughs> and and, and it, 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 of course, it was stupid and silly and, and so on. Uh, it was mockumentary, but it was actually really well constructed as well. Uh, I haven't seen the, the sequel with uh, who uh, poisoned the food so everyone uh, ruined their trousers yet. Um, <laughs> I'm saving that for a you know a moment when I can really concentrate. <laughs> nice, yeah. I unfortunately I'm not qualified to go down the science fiction rabbit hole with you, but uh, but uh, I did see that um, John Hartman, who reviews books, uh, friend of the podcast, who reviews books for for Chess Life, in one of his reviews, he mentioned that Thinking Inside the Box um, was a, had a subtle nod to Doctor Who. So since we're on the subject, could you uh, explain that? Since it's uh, over my head and probably some other people's as well. Okay, so uh, the thing with Doctor Who is that uh, he travels around in a TARDIS. Uh, I cannot tell you what his um, 
uh, what the individual letters means. It's not some with ti- time and something, something, and people will will crucify me for it, but never mind. And somehow it's, it's malfunctioned at some point because it can change to any shape. It's malfunctioned and now has permanently the shape of a 1950s uh, English police box. But it's much bigger on the inside. So there's, there's that. But the only thing of the thing inside the box, the only reason why there's a Doctor Who reference to that is that while I was finishing the book uh, on Facebook, you know, you get these things low like uh, if your birthday is in August, oh, all heroes are born in August or all this nonsense stuff. And then I actually came up at Doctor Who one. It's it's bigger on the inside, thinking inside the box. Ah, okay. <laughs> and I, I just had to get it. Nice. But no, thinking inside uh, the box comes from a Jordan's Muesli commercial, uh, because they they like they, they changed the the wrapping for their muesli. But um, what they was thinking, you know, it's more important was inside the box, and there was a big uh, big banner of that in Glasgow. You know, thinking inside the box, and I was just like, that's exactly what I want to talk about because. We have so many chess books and so much thinking about what is outside uh, the box, you know, the exceptions. People always talk about exceptions in chess. And I, we can go into a very deep discussion about why I think talking about exceptions doesn't make sense, um, but it will become very complicated and uh, very self-observatory, if we can say that. Um, but I thought, you know, what's more important for me is like, let's let's talk about the box here. What is the box? For me, the box is a toolbox. You know, w- w- what are the tools in the box? Let's make sure we have all the tools. And then, you know, if you can operate your tools and so on, yeah, then you can make art later and you can violate the, the convention and so on. But do you know them first? Because chess is not an art form. Uh, first and foremost the people who come to me they don't want to be artists um you know the artists i'm chasing them like uh johanan effect which we had uh, very recently publish a book for us which i've been chasing for 10 years to write this book yeah but people um, have been raving about it i haven't gotten a chance to check it out yet but oh yeah it's, it's uh you know that one and uh, uh the game changer book which i'm sure you're going to talk to these guys uh sattler and uh, yeah and, uh, in a few days well, in a few days yeah, yeah yeah you know i'm uh, i think th- they should be the the two running uh uh the two books in the running for the book of the year uh next time some people sit down to um have you already had a chance to to check out game changer at all uh no i uh i've ordered it but it hasn't arrived okay yeah i've been i've been on a accelerated schedule because i'll be talking to them shortly but yeah it's uh not disappointing so far and it's 400 pages so um there's a lot there's a lot in there Matthew is uh, one of the most amazing people we we have in chess, and uh, you know everyone should should be happy that uh, he chooses to write chess books. Because yeah, he's one of so, those such a fabulous person. Yeah, and he's one of those people who just I I don't know how he does everything that he does. Well, he's extremely smart. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> to, to <laughs> say the he's, least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, so we, we, we're getting sidetracked. Up here. Yeah, so, so thinking inside the box, and um, so what tools do you need in the, uh, in the toolbox? Okay, so now we'll, let's, let's go into that. There's uh, four different types of decisions. Let's go into the big framework here. Uh, first, there's what I call automatic decisions. It's, uh, there is uh, one move in the position, and you should make it. The second is what I call simple decisions. And this is positions where there's not really anything to calculate, uh, but you still have to make a move that improves your position. Then we have critical moments. This is positions where the difference uh, between the best move and the second best move is quite considerable. And finally, we have uh, strategic decisions, which are positions where it's not possible to calculate to the end, where there's many factors in play, um, and you have to combine positional evaluation with, with calculation. So let me go through why I have these four. Uh, I have them, first of all, because I want them all to give us a hint of how should we approach the position. Uh, if it doesn't lead to, a, to an action, it doesn't have value for me. So first of all, with automatic decisions, there's only one move. Um, 
you know, here I, I want to, you know, we're probably going to talk about uh, Viking C as well. So I want to go to the second uh, round game uh, of uh, of Sam Shanklin against Richard Rapport. And I, I would urge anyone listening to this to go to Chess 24 and go Tata Steel Masters 2019. And then if you hover the mouse over oh. Sam's name, you can find the, the I'll games. Pu- I'll put the game in the show description too. Oh, oh, but I'm going to jump to a lot of the games. So, okay. Uh, hopefully. Um, so if you go to move uh, 73, there are, there are other uh, times as well. In the position here, we, we have uh, like uh, 74, sorry, it is. Uh, white play, plays knight f8. And when you have an automatic decision, it's like there's only one move. And here it feels like, and Sam just made h5 uh, after after two minutes and 21 seconds, and he still had a reasonable amount of time at this point. And, uh, okay, it's not entirely automatic, but still he's not considerably uh, going deep of finding is there a difference between h6 and h5. In some positions, it looks like there's only one move, but our action should be candidate moves, looking at the position without calculating, without thinking something about it, simply looking for options. Is there really only one move? If our conclusion is yes, there's only one move, then our action should be playing it. If we say no, there's actually more than one move, and here in this position here, there's clearly, uh, you know, a difference between h6 and h5 if you start thinking about it, because uh, we see quite quickly, uh, if we think in that direction, that the knight on f8 will find it much easier to attack the pawn on h5 than on h6. And uh, and in that reason, we you know we see okay, there's a real reason we should go deeper uh, and think about it. And then already it's not an auto- automatic decision anymore. Um, so that's just using example from from very recent game. Um, and, uh, and and okay, so then we move on to simple decisions. Uh, that's in positions where there's nothing to calculate. But, you, you know, you still have to make moves. And the, a lot of the game is simple decisions. There's not really anything to calculate. Uh, you know, there's nothing in the position you cannot see. There's no hidden options. There's no long variations that will guide you in any way. And about half of all chess players, I would guess, play chess simply by calculating. And a lot of them feel lost. And this is what I call the hammer. Uh, and uh, this comes from when I was working very briefly with Gangulia on on this to- topic only. Um, that uh, you know, Gangulia at this point had already been Asian champion, you know, top hundred player, he's second of Anand, uh, and he didn't know how to play simple positions, how to how to approach them. He had no tools. Uh, he only had the hammer. He calculated amazingly well and he was well prepared, and he was an extremely smart guy but only the hammer. Therefore, you know, thinking inside the box, we need another tool. Um, and there I, I had already developed a, a method, which is uh, the three questions. So the first one is, uh, uh, where are the weaknesses? And games are always decided on weak squares, weak pawns. You know, weak pawns are taken and we lose the end game. Weaknesses is where you're, in your position is where the opponent crashes through. Uh, weaknesses are always important. Um, the ne- second thing is, uh, what's the opponent's idea? This is what's called prophylaxis. You know, this is not nothing new about this. You should know what your opponent is up to. Uh, even if you don't want to stop uh, what he's doing, you still want to be flexible towards it. So you have a possibility to react to, to various things. You know, if you have two moves you're considering and one of them has uh, flexibility about what your opponent might be doing and the other one doesn't, then you have a way to make a choice already. The third one is, which is my worst place piece? Well, if one of your pieces isn't playing, uh, if it doesn't have a function, uh, that's not very good. You're not making the most out of your position. And we're talking about simple decisions here. There's nothing to calculate. It's One move might be a little better than another, we just have to make a lot of them during the game and, and quite uh, quickly often. Uh, and, and these parameters are, are a decent way to, uh, to make uh, 
uh, make decisions. And it falls under a very important uh, rule, which is uh, I can only remember three things. <laughs> right. I cannot I cannot do four things like I always tell you know if I have a a, a a tennis instruction lesson or if I have a guitar instruction lesson like receiving them not giving um I always say to the the trainer the coach and so on never give me more than three ideas <laughs> I can I can I cannot remember more than three ideas um, so, but you know, you could add uh, things like uh, what type of position is it? You know, wh- what is good about my position? Should I play dynamically or should I play statically? Um, there's another good question which uh, Grandmaster Suneberg Hansen from uh, from Denmark uh, sometimes told me. You know, in some conversation uh, about a player, he says, "Oh, he never asked himself how could I lose this game," <laughs> which is a great, which is a great question. Yeah, it is. No, even when you're better, it's just, just no. How would I ever lose this game? How could things go really, really royally wrong? Um, and so, so the, you know, there, there are other questions. I actually sat down and made a list of uh, 12, 13 questions and eventually ended up with these three. And my reason for making questions is that we're very good at finding answers, but finding the questions is really the difficult thing. So I wanted the questions to always be the same. So I found that... The pieces, the opponent, and the weaknesses are the three most uh, important universal things. It doesn't mean that all three questions will give you gold in every position, uh, but usually two out of three will be very meaningful and and will help you to see things you didn't see before, see ideas you didn't see before. And this sounds very simple and something like you would use with kids. And I do use it with kids. I'm asking you know, kids in, in, in the school chess club, which piece isn't playing? Why isn't it playing? You should make all the pieces play before you attack, like simple things. And I ask Shanklin when he's stuck in an exercise, three questions. You know, and this is this is a profoundly intelligent guy, uh, you know, and, and we should probably talk about him specifically a bit further down the, the line of, of this, uh, this interview. Uh, that would be great, yeah. Um, but but I want to go on to the, the the so that's the action for the simple decisions is another form of analysis than variations. Then we have the the third type of a decision, which is critical moments. And critical moments are positions where we have a feeling that the, the difference between the best move and the second best is very high. You cannot go afterwards and say there's some tactic which you never thought was there and say oh you missed the critical moment. It, it doesn't make it uh, useful if you don't know in advance it's a critical moment. And you should develop a feeling for this uh, over time. And a strong player will have a better feeling for when the critical moment is than a weaker player. Uh, but I still think that, that this is where you find a weakness between uh, 27 and 2800 rated players uh, with, with critical moments and adjusting their, their thinking. Um, in in critical moments, it's important not to guess. I, I like to uh, relate it to uh, compare it to a, a math test. You cannot guess in math; you have to work it out. We have mm-hmm. to calculate, and don't use feeling uh, all these kind of things. To some extension, we will, the, our intuition always guides us. You cannot suppress it fully. I'm not programming a computer here. I'm I'm helping people to play better chess. Uh, so, so pedants can you know stay away, please. Um, it's about working it out. Then finally, we have strategic moment positions where it's all very complicated, and we just have to accept that there is no obvious way of approaching them. Sometimes we use general uh, principles. Sometimes we calculate but evaluate at the end. Sometimes it's a method of elimination, maybe. Sometimes it's uh, just what we feel like on the day and we decide to sacrifice the piece because otherwise the game doesn't go into a territory which we like. And I have used all of those uh, ways to make decisions and both uh, uh, successfully and less so. So that's so that's that's the, f- the four types of decision and thinking inside the box covers this quite well uh and it is at the the foundation of my thinking yeah and i think that a lot of our listeners w- will have read will have read it as well as your other books but for anyone who hasn't it does provide an excellent framework um one one question that i asked uh, i am tanya satschev who was recently on and i know has worked with you a bit um is 
what if you just keep forgetting to ask yourself these questions? I mean, so if you're coming, people come with all kinds of baggage and sort of uh, heuristics of uh, how they approach chess um, and they know they need to improve. So how do you learn to to uh, remap your thinking? Um, I should probably first say, and, and you will understand the reference uh, quite well, that I think uh, Tanya, she has... Uh, uh, more balls than most of the people I've worked with. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I think most people listening will get the reference. But a memorable story that Tanya told, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, she was sort of looking for things to be easier, but instead of having some PC explanation of, no, no, you need to be stronger, I was just, you know, I was busy. I was just <laughs> right. As I said to her, for people who haven't heard it, uh, she was like, oh, it's, it's really finding the whole thing very difficult. Grow a pair. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's absolutely true. I did say this. And yes. uh, as, she, as she said, it was in no, me, uh, no way meant as a sexist comment. It, w- it was more like, you know, get on with it. You know, no, you, 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 you just need to, to accept that it's hard and, and get on with it. Um, so, um, yes, what if you forget to ask yourself these questions? Well, it's like any other tool. Uh, if you don't find uh, it's useful in this situation, um, then there are other tools available. And I'm not saying that in simple decisions you should sit at the board and uh, ask yourself these three questions all the time. Uh, actually, uh, I used to always recommend that you didn't because I thought it would drive anyone insane. And I did that at some point in front of Sabino Brunello, who was my student for five years, uh, who peaked at around 2650, and then stopped. Uh, we stopped working together because he didn't want to work anymore, hmm. uh, didn't want to work as hard. And, um, and he said, oh, really? No, no, especially if I'm in bad form, I, I always use them. Uh, it's, it helps me not blunder at least. Um, but I do recommend not to use them so much uh, during the game, like sitting asking yourself this all the time. Chess is just too rich to be um, be limited to some kind of, of little formula. Um, they are meant to simply draw out the chess that's already inside of you. Uh, they're not, uh, they're open questions and everyone will interpret them uh, in a different way. They are created very much for me to be able to have a conversation with you or with someone else about a position. So we can look at the elements individually and we can talk about them. They are uh, developed um, in a way that we can train them. So you should always have a good feeling of where the weaknesses are, uh, which piece isn't playing, what your opponent is trying to do. Um, But I would like it to be quite internalized through a lot of training. And sometimes if you're stuck, it's good to pull out the questions and make it a bit more conscious. Yeah, and I guess if, no, if nothing else, when some, someone can develop the habit of when they feel stuck in a position, referring back to those questions. I, I think uh, the, the moment you try to program someone uh, into doing something as complex as chess in a simplistic way, um, uh, you, you will run into side effects you don't want. Um, I'm trying to start with the the point of view that uh, the people I work with are, are intelligent, and uh, and from there on, uh, you know, helping them will be great. But they still uh, know what they're doing. I'm excited to announce that this week's episode of Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chessable. If you're a regular listener to Perpetual Chess, you've probably heard me and our esteemed guests extol the virtues of Chessable even when they were not our sponsors. Chessable uses learning science to help you improve your chess as efficiently as possible. It's a great way to remember more ideas faster, even for a middle-aged dad like me. What's more, they're an open platform where anyone can publish their courses. I'm talking to you, chess teachers and coaches. And they paid out hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions to their partner authors. They have big plans for 2019. So if you're a student, author, or coach, be sure to check out chessable.com. While we're on the topic of chess improvement, of course, we got a couple questions from from supporters of the podcast um, related to this topic because um, I I think you... uh, you can probably you can probably help them out a bit. So, so the first question is from uh, Alex Benio. Alex asks, uh, provided that your books generally have a great amount of exercises, he's interested in knowing what's your take on how to approach chess books and, and yours in particular. If there's a diagram, read them. And- read them. 
Actually, <laughs> actually, John has told me that uh, I should say that people should buy books. It's not important to read them. <laughs> right. if, you have a book, if you have a book at home and you haven't read it, it means that's not the right book for you. Go buy another one, especially <laughs> exactly. for quality chess. Spoken like a true publisher. <laughs> um, yeah, well said. <laughs> and so I, I had followed up with Alex to ask for clarification on this one, but basically he's saying like your eyes, when you see a diagram in a position, one's eyes are drawn to them. But so how much should you think about the diagram right away as opposed to reading everything that someone says about it and then going back to the diagram? Okay, so uh, diagrams has many functions in chess books. The, the main function they have is uh, for people who go through a, a chess book with uh, a board. And then uh, at some point we have all these variations going, especially if it's opening books, going really, really into uh, to details. And then we have to find our way back again and we don't want to go to the starting position, which I was doing until the age of like 25 um which is i don't recommend it was a, it was a waste of time and and stupid and uh but you you sort of had to uh get the right position and unless you're really really experienced you, you know there's always one or two bits that goes wrong and you know when i do a a, a, a lecture on a demo board there will always be someone who says no no the piece is the king's back on on h1 or something like this um and the same thing when you play through a book with a with a board so the diagrams are mainly for you to find your way back um they also to for the author to highlight that this moment you should pay extra attention because most of us will sort of read and nod and not really you know we'll be looking at the book more than the board if we were playing with a board They're also for people who are reading without a board uh so that they don't have to uh become world champions in, in blindfold chess to be able to do that and you know like uh, my friend jan marcos uh, at some point uh was reading one of my books and he suddenly told me afterwards that, oh, suddenly I realized that some books, some people actually use a chess board uh, when they read chess books. It never <laughs> occurred to me. And must, some people must never, be nice. <laughs> must some, be nice. People never, some people never occurred to read one without. So, uh, But uh, it has these functions. I want to say about with relating to some people want to use every diagram as an exercise. Um, there are more high quality exercises in the world specifically picked for their value then there are days and hours and years in your life um, I would rather than going by random exercises where you will get random value out of uh, thinking over them uh, I would go by solving the exercises that uh, the trainers and, uh, and authors are assigning uh, in my own books, I started uh, something which has been copied by others, which was uh, I found some uh, positions uh, during uh, chapters uh, which were interesting and could be exercises in their own right, and then uh, put them in the start of the chapter. I, I did it first in the attacking manual, um, and, and some of those exercises were used by, by Anand for his uh, preparation for the Topalov match. Uh, in 2010 um, and you know but in general I wouldn't you know stop and think in, in every position um, especially now where um, there's my books there's Arthur's books there's Roman Edouard's books um, there's uh, Grabinski's fantastic book uh, Perfect Your Chess uh, there's a, a book of a huge, huge favorite of mine, which uh, seems to no longer be in print, which is called Imagination in Chess by uh, Gapridnas, really, uh, which is a beautiful uh, little book on, on candidate moves. Um, I don't I don't like his uh, thinking about how to think very much, but uh, that's only like six pages of the book. The exercises are great. Yeah, that's the one that you said. You, you At one point, you found a pile of them, and you just bought them all so that you could give them to uh to friends yeah, they, were, they were for sale in the london chess center four or five and i bought like 12 of them i think <laughs> and they didn't have anyone left <laughs> so listeners keep an eye out i know that i am eric rosen also recommended that book i haven't gotten my hands on one yet but um but it sounds worth checking out for sure um 
So, and what about in terms of classics? So, those are some modern classics. What are your, well, I mean, Imagination in Chess is a bit older, but what are your, your uh, like, uh, coming up as a chess player, what were your favorite chess books? Well, um, I was uh, very fortunate that um, maybe the best chess writer of all time uh, was Danish, and I was Danish, so I could read Ben Larsen as a child. Um, I mainly read chess books in Danish until I was... I think already towards an I am a level. Um, also, of course, uh, Nimsovich uh, wrote my system in German, but he lived in Denmark at the time, and it was available in Danish as well. Um, so, uh, Ben Larsen's books like uh, Three Points Ahead and uh, Fifty Selected Games and stuff like that. I have a I have a signed copy from from Ben uh, of Fifty Selected Games where he he wrote some nice things to me, and then afterwards he crossed me in a simul. <laughs> I was I was twenty four fifty, and wow. he just crossed me. But in in all fairness, I played a, quite an interesting opening idea. I had been crossed with by a GM myself, and he crossed it. He refuted it in simul at huh. the board. Amazing. Well. There was, uh, you know, one of the most profound human beings uh, that that I think has has lived. Uh, just totally unique uh, and intelligent human being. Uh, funny, um, you know, talented uh, and giving. This just a wonderful human being. And also a very good chess player. Yeah, <laughs> so, minor, minor detail. <laughs> well... Uh, and and so I enjoyed his uh, writing. Uh, later on, of course, I I read a lot of Dreschke's books, and um, they don't in English they don't stand up to the test of time now. Um, the and I, I talk about the books that were bu- published by Batchford and then Olms. Anything after that are perfect, you know, and they're like not perfect but perfect. They they're fantastic. Um, but the other books. Um, Mark had computer checked them uh, before his death, and all the corrections have been put in the Russian editions, but the uh, Alms uh, didn't think it was worth the effort of putting them in. That's one of, you know, this kind of attitude was one of the reasons why I wanted to do my own publishing house. I was going to say, it sounds like a project for quality chess. Well, well, we don't have the rights. Uh, okay. And uh, if if uh, they were to be republished, which I hope they will be, they will no doubt be published by uh, Russell uh, Publication. Mark and I was very close friends, uh, but his publishing house was uh, was Russell, and I, I don't see a contradiction in that. You know, we published uh, Yusupa, which uh, Mark and and Arthur are extreme were extremely close, and uh, you know, as close as two two men can be in a in a classical way. So I, I want to get back to uh, chess improvement, and we'll have um, some more questions along that line. But hearing you talk about Mark Dvoretsky and Ar- Arthur Yusupov and uh, elite um, trainers like that makes makes me wonder. Another question I wanted to ask you was um, in your in your development as a trainer was there was there a moment where where you decided you would focus more on sort of high level training because there are a lot of a uh, lot of grandmasters who who make their living or part of their living in, in helping chess players improve. But, but it seems like your work is geared more towards, uh, fellow professionals. So what did, was that a conscious decision on your part? No. So how do you think it came about? Um, first, I, I was going to a, a rapid tournament in Rome, I think 2004, and uh, I, I arrived a day earlier, and so did uh, a young girl who had won uh, an award. Uh, and from from the organizer, who was also a pop chess publisher in Italian. Uh, and she had won some scholarship, like 50 books or something, so she arrived a day early as well. And uh, at some point, they were setting up, and I asked, do you want to play? And so we played, and then I explained some things, and her mother was impressed. And she asked if I could uh, teach her son. I um, said, sure. Uh, and, and that's how I started working with C- Sabino Brunello, who went from 2,400. Uh, he was about to become an IM when we started working together. And then when we stopped working together five, six years later, um, 
He won Vikancy with 11 out of 13. He was 10th in the European Championship, qualified for the World Cup, and decided that he didn't want to do any training anymore because it was work. Yeah. Hard work. And he... He's Italian, and <laughs> he, you know he's a you know he's a fantastic person. And if someone is listening and 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 want a good uh, coach, then I would highly recommend Sabino. Uh, he's available on Facebook and 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 elsewhere. Um, so so that happened, and then in two thousand and nine, same tournament, same village. I met uh, this other guy uh, called Boris Gelfand. Uh, and yeah. And uh, we went to this um, um, press conference together and Boris talked for two hours and I only said one thing and I was asked at some point, the journalist felt sorry for me sitting at the podium and never saying anything. And what do you think? You know, are you going to win the tournament? I said, don't be ridiculous. The (laughs) difference between Boris and me is like between me and a a 2100 player. And Boris was, yeah, 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 it's absolutely right. <laughs> the next day, I totally outplayed him, of course. And then, <laughs> uh, then I was running out of time, and I, uh, I said to him, well, what do you think about a draw? He said, yeah, of course. And I had an extra piece, uh, and I'm, I'm not, there was some technical difficulty. I'm not sure I would have won it easily. And with the time, for sure, I would have lost some time. But uh, we have a draw, and, you know, we both uh, performed according to standard in uh, the tournament. I made, like four and a half out of eight or four out of eight and he made seven and a half out of eight uh, but you know we we talked a lot and I gave him some exercises and uh, famously I gave him uh, one of my favorite exercises which is from uh, um, which is in thinking inside the boxes from a game against Jonathan Rousen in the British Championship uh, 2007 uh, it's the start of uh, chapter four or something and uh, he thought for like half an hour and he was like, he couldn't solve it. Then we went for dinner and then uh, we had starters, we had mains. And then uh, just before the desserts were served, uh, Boris said, okay, Jakob, take me out of my misery. That was the, uh, play? the queen. What should I play? <laughs> the queen D5 one? Is oh, that... no, 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 don't give it away. Don't give it away. <laughs> okay. No, 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 don't give it away. Yeah, uh, I solved it. I mean, I'm, I'm not one to brag. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, and you told a great story. Oh, no, no, and... no. The thing is, uh, actually, uh, pl- a lot of players between uh, 1800 and 2200 uh, solved it quite easily. Because they... Uh, eat... because, because somehow uh, the, the unnaturalness of the solution uh, just doesn't uh, occur to them because they don't see it as unnatural. Right. And when I gave <laughs> Boris the first move, he says, yeah, okay, and then this. Uh, but... Um, but yeah, and then, and then I said, "Oh, I have some some positions if you want." And I gave him a file of positions, and uh, uh, he sent me an email uh, like a week later and said, "Well, I I tried to solve them, and I failed for the first ten ones." And I thought, "Okay, I have to take this seriously." Wow! And then uh, he started taking it seriously, and uh, he started winning. He won the World Cup, and then he asked for more exercises, and then he asked for more exercises, and he asked for more exercises, and uh, he kept so winning. Did you have more in store, or were you like, uh, no, uh, did you have to sc- scramble to find material when, uh, oh, when he gosh. asked? That's a lot of work. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and then later on, you know, we had slight cash flow problem in 2012, and I said to John, you know, I have an idea here. Um, cheapest author in the world, myself, free. <laughs> uh, I'll just uh, bang out a, a few quick, uh, quick books, you know, just some, uh, so we can get a, a little bit of money in. Um, so I, uh, I banged out uh, calculation and positional play and strategic play in, in like, I don't know, nine, 12 months uh, just from, from the stock. And then there was sort of spread out because of uh, not interfering with each other in sales terms, um, but they were not meant to. They were not meant to be popular. They were just meant to sell a few copies and 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 bring in a little bit of money. Um, but uh, you know, like one one guy uh, who won the European Championship uh, called it the the most important chess books ever written, which is obviously false. But still, I'm very flattered. Yeah. Um, and 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 they were not they were not designed to be you know 
They were uh, just positions that you'd, you'd built up over time. Yeah, and- it, was, it was just Boris's training material. Oh, let me publish this and, and, and just, okay. Then, you know, for calculation, I, I wrote to Mark and said, okay, I have this material. How should I structure it? I know you have an idea of a book that you will never get around to writing, uh, where it's structured by decisions. Yeah, you do this, 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 this. I just did it as Mark uh, prescribed. So, you know, I, I claim no credit. Um, well- you're you're too modest, but uh, but the the story about uh, kind of publishing them on a whim is very is very interesting. Um, I I don't think a lot of uh, listeners would would have guessed that that wasn't. Oh, there's no master plan at all. And what about the Gelfand books themselves? Um, when how did those come about? Well, we were talking about about how I became a high level trainer because it actually followed very natural from this that uh, then a young man from California who just finished. Uh, university decided he wanted to give uh, playing chess for a living uh, a go, uh, contacted me and said he had uh, enjoyed uh, those three books. And would I do a, a training session with him, uh, a week of, of, of uh, training camp? And uh, his name is, of course, uh, Sam Shankland. I said, sure. Uh, and uh, he came over and, and Paid me some some money, and I gave him some positions, and we talked about his his what he was thinking, and um, and then you know he enjoyed it, and then we continued doing it. I sent him more positions. He continued to say what he was thinking. I started to get more and more confident about what I would recommend, and started to think more and more about. Uh, how to approach things and I came up with you know uh, I thought I actually wanted to map out what kind of decisions there are I come up with this idea of the four decisions which of course is not the only way of portraying stuff it's just one way of of looking at things Um, and then uh, in 2014 he won some tournaments he made nine out of ten at the Olympiad after having missed uh, missed some wins at the end um he beat Judith Polka in her last ever game, uh, made a gold medal, um, and won like 60, 70 rating points. And uh, it just, we just, you know, he was like, I don't know why I'm suddenly playing so well, he said to me, Randa. <laughs> and I was like, could you be, be having any connection to all the work we have been doing? He said, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we continued working and he continued improving. And I have later had people come to me and say, you know, I used to be, you know, junior with Sam Shanklin and he was not very good. And now he <laughs> look at him now. Um, could you help me too? And this is sort of how it developed. Um, and... I want to point out something about Sam that I don't think people understand. Um, Like, for example, last year, uh, he performed at number 12 in the world. If we were using the same kind of uh, rating as they do in tennis or snooker or or I I don't know if golf also uses a yearly one, he would have been number 12 in the world at the end of the year. You know, now he, he probably won't qualify for the Grand Prix because he started the year with a low rating. And for the Grand Prix to, that will be held in the middle of 2019, his rating at the start of 2018 will will uh, will keep him out of it. But he won the U.S. Championship, then he won in Havana with a full-point lead, and then he won the Pan American Championship. And that was a good run, a good 35 days or 45 days or something. And he jumped to 27-25. Um, but then what often happens for people who do that is then they drop again. And now we are uh, a year later. The U.S. championship will come up in, uh, I think, two months' time or, or less. And uh, he's going into that with 27.31, his highest ever rating. Uh, and if you look at the current uh, list of players with over 2,700, I think by the age of 21 or 22, uh, at the latest for these guys, everyone was in top 30 at some point. Everyone. I, tr- I tried, you know, at some point I thought, no, Nidich wasn't. You know, like, Nidich is like number 22 or something at the moment, or 20. And he's a fabulous player, very, very uh, entertaining player, uh, almost a manic playing style. Um, 
And I thought, no, okay, he's the exception, except from Sam. And then I looked, and no, actually, uh, at rating 2670, uh, 12 years ago or something, he was number 30 in the world. Um, so Sam is the only player uh, of modern day who makes it into the, the high uh, levels of chess without having gone there just after the junior years or in the junior years. And I think that achievement is profoundly, uh, you know, commendable. Uh, and, of course, you know, I have, I've worked with him, I've helped him, and sometimes, uh, I, you know, I'm frustrated because he hasn't done what I've been saying, and he should have. And sometimes I have not been able to help him, and... Um, and I've worked with other people, uh, and most often it's gone well, and not always. And and, and there's been some 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 huge disappointments uh, along the way. And some of them are because uh, people haven't been doing what I think they should be doing. And some of them has been because I haven't been able to help them. And 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 maybe working with me wasn't the right thing for them at that time. Um, uh, so I don't want to claim credit for, for what Sam has done because he's worked incredibly hard. Um, but what it, it does show is that it is possible to develop past the, the early years and to develop immensely. Yeah, even at the top level. Which even if, at, at which, the top level. Which if it can be done at that level, it can be done at lower levels as, as well. Where everyone keeps developing, and uh, you know, we haven't seen the the peak from Sam at all. And I, I had a conversation with Sam a year and a half ago, and it's a private conversation, and maybe I shouldn't talk about it, but uh, I think everyone wants to know that uh, Sam at some point uh, called me up and says, "Do you really think I can do it? Do you really think I can get past twenty seven hundred?" And should I just wrap it up and teach chess for a living and, and just accept where I am? And this is like one of my, my, uh, my guiding principles is that everything that's worthwhile doing takes longer to achieve than we want it to, even though we know it takes longer to achieve than we want it to. And I, all I could say to him at that point was, um, you know, I am absolutely convinced about it, but I really don't know. I just think we're doing the right work and that in, term, in time it will pay off. And we just don't know when it, that will be. And we just need to keep going. And we don't have to uh, keep confidence. We just need to keep doing the work. And you can lose confidence someday and, 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 and be unsure of yourself and if you're doing the right thing, but just continue working. And he was like, okay. So we'll, we'll continue working. And I talked to him uh, yesterday. I, I don't know when this will be broadcast, but yesterday was the last round of uh, uh, Vikense. And he performed like, okay, six and a half out of uh, 13. Uh, and in the last two rounds, he beat Nepomniachtchi and Kramnik. It was not not very good games. Uh and before that, he had uh, this resignation against Giri in a, a drawn position uh, where he had a fortress, um, right. which was very unfortunate because uh, everyone who, who, who knew him had seen it was a fortress. You know, I, I, I actually told um, my girlfriend that uh, Sam will, will make a draw, and he didn't even make a move. Uh, so uh, that was not uh, very good, and... Uh, and, and in, overall, the tournament was horrible for him. Um, you know, we, I mentioned the rapport game. People can uh, can play through. There was a, at one point, uh, let me just find the moment here. Uh, there was a really horrible moment uh, in the game. It is move 50. It's black to play. And uh, Sam, he played way too fast. Uh, at two minutes, he played a knight takes c4. And uh, white played bishop f2. And at this moment, Sam had planned to play knight d6, bishop d4, e d4. And he had simply missed that white can take the pawn on c5. And this is a really horrible blunder. Uh, 
And if he had, mm-hmm. you know, been been less restless and been more focused or something, he would have played knight takes e4 and the game wins itself. And this is like a critical moment. He has to slow down. And you can see that he played knight c4 after two minutes. Uh, Rapport instantly played bishop f2. And then Sam thought for nine minutes. And I'm uh, sure that he, part of what he was thinking is, oh, God, I'm such an idiot. Hmm. And he had this horrible, horrible result. And he won six rating points. And he beat, in my opinion, the greatest player who had lived in, in my lifetime, Vladimir Kramnik, in not uh, by any means one of the greatest games Kramnik has played. But, but he still beat you know, most amazing player I've seen in my lifetime, the deepest chess player. Wow. So you put, uh, I will get back to Shanklin, but you put him ahead of Carlsen in terms of uh, highest level? Well, Carlsen is, is maybe the best player, but, but Kramning is, has changed chess so profoundly. He's just such a deep player, and, and the understanding of chess uh, from Kramnik has, has just broadened so immensely. Uh, and, and Carlson is, uh, you, you know, it's just a smooth machine. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like I'm not appreciating what Carlson is doing. Um, but uh, I, I rate uh, Kasparov as a, a better player at his peak than than, than Kramnik. I just think Kramnik's uh, contribution to chess is just much higher. Hmm. Uh, it's a uh, it's just really really deep chess and then some really profound things and i understand if some people were feeling that uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to get under the skin of it um which is quite normal with something which is is truly profound um but anyway i was what i said to sam yesterday was i'm i'm sort of tired of qualifying my uh, my prophecies and 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 no, you you will actually improve quite considerable from where you are now because you clearly left points here and there against Rapport. He didn't win this horrible game. He didn't win the first game against Mamajarov, uh, which was very disappointing. And then he resigned in a drawn position against Giri. Um, and there's so many th- things to improve still. Um, so yeah, of course uh, he will improve immensely. And uh, I, I would not be surprised if he makes it to the top 10. I'm expecting it, to be honest. Yeah, now, 27 years old, already in the top 30 and still improving. Um, it's, it's almost like, I mean, obviously, it's so competitive up there, but it wouldn't be as shocking as the leap that he's already made. It wouldn't, I feel like it wouldn't be as unprecedented. Obviously, um, you know, it's anything like that is going to be easier said than done. But I mean, he clearly belongs on that stage. Um, you know, uh, mistimed blunder. I mean, resignation against Geary, notwithstanding. Um, uh, as you say, I mean, to to have an off tournament and put up that kind of result is just incredible, and and it's definitely inspiring. That and some he's he's making all these improvements, and somehow he even managed to churn out an acclaimed chess book for you guys while while doing it. Absolutely. <laughs> knows where his uh, bread is buttered. Um, uh, well, he he might have had a, um, a good advice from someone on how to put it together. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. All right, so we've got another question from a listener. Uh, pivoting back to chess improvement a bit before I let you get out of here, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so Chris Wayne Scott, who I believe you know, and gave yes. me some uh, GM level prep on uh, pronouncing your name, although. Um, still need some work to, to do. But he asks, um, when working with a coach, it's easy to identify one's weaknesses since the coach will do that for you. However, when not working with a coach, what are some things a player can do to self-identify their weaknesses? Analyze your games deeply. When this, this is what, what strong players have always done. Analyze their own games deeply. And this is not sitting uh, with chess space and pressing the space bar and think that there's a variation. No, you're trying to find out uh, the questions like, why is this move better than what I played? How could I have found this move? Why is uh, why did I lose this position which was equal? How Here I feel I'm better. Two or three moves later, I don't think I'm better anymore. The computer doesn't give me an answer. What can I do? What, what are the principles I, I can approach this position? You can constantly ask yourself questions. Uh, you don't need a trainer uh, to do that. 
I think having a trainer is uh, can be very useful. But like, for example, I, I make it a, a point of being the student in some of the things I do. Uh, I take tennis lessons or I, I did uh, until my uh, tennis coach got fired uh, <laughs> for drug abuse. Um, I take uh, guitar lessons. I occasionally take singing lessons. Uh, my, my girlfriend just had a fit. What's that? I, 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 yeah, I should say there was also some gambling involved. <laughs> in, in what? In uh, I think she's pulling out her hair now. Uh oh! It uh, sounds, in, sounds like she needs to get on the mic. <laughs> I think people can hear her laughing in the background. <laughs> um, no, but I make a point of being the student as well, so I have a feeling of being on the other side of the fence, knowing which kind of questions it is. But you know, and like in learning to play the guitar better, I spend at least twenty hours on my own for every one hour I have with. Uh, a uh, coach, uh, an instructor. And some of the things is we're going through his program, but also I compile my questions when I'm trying to do this, you know, like finger roll with the pinky or, or you know, or bending or, or, or something like that. And uh, when I have to f- follow a bend with a slide, why am I not getting it to sound smooth? And, you know, in chess, there will be different questions uh, like uh, why, why do I constantly struggle when I get out of uh, the opening or, you know, why is it I lose all these equal endings like this one and this one? And, and, and it's good to have uh, this kind of qualified assistance. And sometimes they will tell you things that you hadn't thought of. But you can also get quite far on your own. Uh, and there is a lot of material in books. A lot of what I do is I present um, strong players with uh, positions and then I... I talked to them about their decision-making process. I had one position at a, a training camp I did uh, where a player of, uh, of 2650, uh, he answered the question of which move would you play and this move, why do you choose this move? It was the one I spent the most time thinking about. Hmm. And I suggested to him a different way of making a decision, which is have your options, analyze them one by one, and then play the one you like the best. And he was like, actually, that, that, that's once or twice where that would have been a good idea. Um, so, um, so analyze your own games and find out what you want to work with. And then there is a lot of great uh, material available from us, from uh, Russell publication. They have the, the Dredge books. There's uh, thinkers are trying to do a lot of very interesting things. Uh, there's a few good books from from New and Chess as well. Uh, Gambit still have a, a lot of good books. Uh, there, there's a lot of material. There are videos on Chess Twenty Four and many other forums. So there's a lot of material out there. If you have something you want to work on, you know, go find something that speaks to you, and then 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 continue working with it there to try to solve the problems you establish yourself. But actually analyzing your own games is really, really important skill to develop. And you need to understand that you need to develop the skill. Um, there are two things I want to talk to talk about before the end, if that's all right with you. Of course. Okay, so the first one is over the last five years, I received more and more requests uh, from people around the world for how can I improve and would you please teach me? <laughs> And, uh, you know, some of them are, I am 18 years old, my rating is 1500, I want to be world champion, will you be my trainer? And this is, it sounds exaggerated, but I think that's more or less a quote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I normally say no thank you to that. Um, I have two students that I spend time with. I spend time with Sam. Uh, I send positions to Boris still, but uh, he's no longer really active. You know you wanted to talk about uh, Boris's books, but I think it's much better. I'll throw Boris uh, at you when we do the next book. And that would be amazing, him. yeah. Well, I'll catch him. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I, will, uh, I will tell him he has to, uh, to do it, uh, and he will uh, tell me to get lost, but do it anyway. <laughs> uh, because he's a really nice guy. Uh, so I d- we decided to do this uh, Quality Chess Academy, uh, which is camps in Crete, which is a 
a Greek island, and it's a really, really wonderful uh, place. Uh, the hotel's called Lutus, and I think technically it's four stars, but they... Is it five stars? Okay, how many four-star hotels do you know that they have a, a water park on-site? Okay, yeah, they have a water park on-site, so okay. you can bring, bring, bring your kids. Um, the the price is uh, for for shared room is something like fifty sixty uh, euros uh, a night on if you're part of our our camp, and it's all inclusive. It's uh, like inclusive bar, inclusive food. There's a few restaurants. It's on the beach. There's nine swimming pools. Some rooms have their own swimming pool, but they're a little more expensive. Not much more, but a little more expensive. And then we charge, I think. Uh, Something like 800 euros uh, plus maybe a little bit. I don't know what the exchange rate is um, for training. And uh, last time it was girlfriend and myself. Uh, and this time in May, 8th to 14th, it will be um, myself and uh, maybe the best chess trainer in the world, Arby Ramesh from uh, India, with, uh, which is... Uh, Famously, uh, the trainer of uh, Pragnananda and some 38 uh, youth world champions. And 38 is actually the accurate number, I think. Uh, wh one year, he won half his school, his academy, one out of 100 academies in Chennai, maybe. Won half the gold medals at the youth uh, world championships. Wow, and he was the trainer for the Indian Olympiad team as well, right? Yeah, for the men's for long team. Yeah, he was also the coach when they won bronze in, in, in 2014. And he used to play for them. And he was also British champion when he was open for the Commonwealth. And he is, beside that, he's a truly fantastic human being. Um, so I wanted to, to say that we're there. Um, I always want to say that, well, like, so... So many things we are I'm doing these days. This is this is uh, not making me any money. I'm uh, I think last time it costed me three hundred dollars to hold the camp, and I think this time it will be something similar. Sounds and like you need to charge more, Jakob. No, 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 no. I but you know if if someone else wants to come and we, we'll, we'll be a small group, we'll be like a dozen. And it's just a really good time. And, you know, if you don't spend your life having a really good time, you're really wasting it. And I, I have a house. I have 20 guitars. Yes. Wow. I have 20 guitars. Uh, and I don't have enough time to play them, but, the old, but I do play them all, uh, most of them. Um, and I go lots of places. I have lots of fun. I have beautiful kids. And they don't lack for anything. I don't need more money, but this is really good fun. It's like it would be this beautiful place. We'll have this beautiful food. it will be really lovely people around, a really good atmosphere. Fear. I live in Scotland. This is Crete. If it rains, it will be like for one hour, one day, not like one hour, one day, no rain. Um, and, you know, at the end of it, I will have had a holiday where I get to talk for – about chess for six hours a day and my girlfriend won't be angry with me <laughs> she'll be at the pool at least she won't be angry for that maybe, maybe and, and if people have any problems during the camp or you know if they bring a spouse or something they want to get an excursion she's there and we'll uh, we'll help them uh, organize everything and uh, she, she is from crete originally so uh, she's a local and uh, and can help with that. That's why we decided to do it there. So I, wa I wa wanted to just push it. Okay, um, and is there it, any... It, does, it doesn't make me money. It's not about money, but it would really be great if some more people came so we could do it again. Well, it sounds amazing. Or, or is there any rating cutoff? Like, is there a, a no, rating... We, ha we have two coaches, so we're going to divide everything into two groups. So we're going to have one group, which is like title players, maybe 2,300 plus. And then we're going to have one group, which is everyone else. Because there's so few people, we can... It, a lot of the interaction will be one on one. Uh, you know, there will be a lot of, of, of solving involved. There'll be some of it will be um, um, playing out of position, but some of it will be lectures. Uh, but when they're solving, you know, I did a, a one day seminar in the Philippines on my, my book tour where there was 160 people there, and I managed to get around and talk to everyone almost twice. Um, during this four-hour session, 
So I can manage to to spend quite a lot of time with with five people in a classroom or seven people in a classroom for a, a two hour session uh, and really help people and and guide people. Uh, so I and it's really good value. You can you can check the hotel cost on Booking dot com. You can see that uh, unlike most uh, chess events, uh, we're actually offering a better rate than uh, you can get on the internet and not a worse rate. <laughs> So anyway, I, wa- I wanted to uh, to put that in. Um, I don't think uh, necessarily anyone will come, but I think least- I think someone might. I mean, I would love to. My kids in school. Then I mean, also I'm. Oh, everyone like- would love to come. It's just uh, for some for some reason, uh, you know. I think the fact that we have to be off season to get the good prices means that uh, we have we have less of an audience. Um, but you know we have, we have a good time. If anyone wants to join, I want the option to exist. This is this is why I'm doing this. I'm going to do camps in Charlotte, in St. Louis, in uh, in Germany, in Spain. Where else are we going? Prague. Prague. No, no. This holiday, we're going to see, go and see Metallica in Prague. Hmm. That's so 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 far, nobody has uh, contacted me for a camp in Prague. So we're not doing that uh, yet. I have to say, uh, previously, six days uh, holiday has turned into a, a four-day work weekend, and I went home early. <laughs> uh, so, I'm, am I forgiven yet? <laughs> I, I don't think so, but it's still funny. So, anyway, I wanted to talk about that. I also want to talk about uh, FIDE, of course. Yes. Uh, the, the, the whole reason why I finally said yes to doing this was because... I've, I knew this was coming when you when you originally asked, and, uh, and now I, uh, it's, it's happening. And I'm cha- uh, a chairman of the trainers uh, commission with FIDE, and I would like to to just talk about it uh, for a moment. And I think probably you should start by asking questions. Okay. How about we'll start with the basics. What is the the FIDE the FIDE trainers commission? Okay, the FIDES Trainers Commission is um, given the job of uh, licensing chess trainers. It's that simple, um, which so far has uh, meant that uh, they are getting some tests which are maybe in relevance are similar to uh, nationality tests where you have to learn something for a test or know something for a test and then you will never ever use it in your profession or in nationality test you will never ever use it again like i took a uk nationality test uh, at some point and these questions uh, if i hadn't read the book i wouldn't know and i don't know them the answers to them now and no one cares and right. doesn't matter um so what's happening in FIDE at the moment is uh, it's in a big changing process and uh, there will be positive and negative to that um, and it's uh, the stated objective is to uh, take it away from an organization that has used its resources to benefit individuals into uh, benefiting the, uh, the f- members which are the federations and to uh, benefit the spreading of chess the strategic objective at the moment is to uh, give as many people in the world uh, access to, to chess and availability to chess and get so many of them interested as want to. Um, so that's sort of a, a change from from previously where they were sort of keeping the thing going uh, while keeping in, in position. Um so the in in the trainers commission we are uh, working now on creating a real curriculum uh, which will be uh, have two uh, structures the one is a curriculum for students which is like a, you could say a curriculum for for school we recommend these 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 books like you would do in a university uh, we think you should read this book this book and this book and this book and then you will improve you will get better at your your field. And then we are working on a curriculum for coaches, which is how do you become a good uh, chess coach? And in order to, uh, to achieve this, which of course we will fail, but hopefully we will do a very good attempt. Um, so 
in order to do that, I have managed to engage some of the, the greatest chess coaches from around the world. And, uh, and, and some of them are uh, involved as a more or less a personal favor to me. Like we have uh, Alexander Motulev from, uh, from Russia, who was European champion, uh, coach of European champion, of course, coach of Kayakin and coach of the Russian team and many other strong Russian players. We have Ramesh with all his world champions and all my envy. <laughs> uh, we, have, uh, we have people from, from other uh, parts of the world which are maybe not so, so famous, but are really, uh, really uh, great guys. We have uh, uh, Sami Kada from uh, Jordan who has done a lot of work to, uh, to spread chess in the, the Arab world. We have uh, Watu Kubese from uh, South Africa. From the U.S., we have uh, two fantastic uh, human beings uh, and great coaches. We have Alonso Zapata, which is, lives in Atlanta, but is not uh, uh, is not uh, American. Of course, I think he's this is, is Colombia eventually. I think it's Colombia. Uh, and we have uh, Meli Kachan from uh, Los Angeles, also coach of the U.S. women's team. Uh, and we have really a very diverse uh, group of people helping. So one of them is we, we will to create these curriculums, which meaning we will also um, put higher uh, uh, qualifications into the trainer titles. And uh, as a part of, uh, of that, we will also have to look into the award uh, process. We we have had in the past a situation where a person appoints himself for a feeder appointed job, uh, and represents a feeder as a coach at an event, and then afterwards uh, nominates himself for an award uh, <laughs> with a with a committee of people that he have appointed, consisting mainly of his friends, who then gives him the award. And then uh, at the award ceremony, he hands over the award to himself. Right. Um, and I want to point out one thing. I'm not saying he wasn't worthy of the award, but uh, we need a different process. And uh, we, we, we need a, a modern and professional way of, of doing things where uh, we cannot have a award ceremony where we try to involve, as we have done, 15 of the, the greatest coaches from around the world. We also have Stefan over from, from Bulgaria. We have Yu Xiaoteng from, from China, with the, who is trainer of Yu Wenjun, the world champion, and, and of the uh, Chinese women's team, who is the Olympic champions. Um, you know, we have all these great people uh, Connected. I talked earlier about Grabinski's great book, uh, Perfect Your Chess. He's also uh, on the commission. Uh, we have all these great players. We cannot have awards um, um, without, without having them uh, uh, involved uh, in the competition. Or it doesn't make sense. You, for best junior trainer, you want to beat Ramesh, but we cannot have it that... You know, at the same time, we're involved in handing out the awards. Right. Um, so so we will have to create a process for that. Then we have to build up a, a whole academy structures. At the moment, uh, we have a structure where we're not really sure what's behind the academies. Uh, some of the registered academies are just shells. It's uh, someone's address and nothing is really happening, but... Academies at the moment are entitled to send players to youth world championships and youth continental championships uh, around federations uh, selection procedures. Um, and federations actually have expenses on that behalf. And, uh, you know, this is... I, if if it was uh, designed with corruption in mind, then it would be the way you would do it. Right. Um, so we, we have a lot of things we have to change, and uh, we want to have a situation at some point where actually there are real feeder academies, um, re regional feeder academies, um, both online and uh, and in the real world, and. Uh, there are, there are many challenges, and we're trying to deal with that as well as uh, three and a half thousand registered trainers. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really huge challenge. And we are just one out of, I think, 17 commissions. Wow. 
and uh, I think everyone coming into this uh, thought that their own own area was a mess, but the other areas were maybe okay. And uh, I learned in a, a meeting that uh, there is basically a mess everywhere. And uh, of course, FIDE uh, now is going to make a lot of mistakes. And, and there are things that, that I haven't agreed with that have been decided. But the challenge is just immense. And the resources are definitely limited. You know, I do this entirely voluntary. I don't, wow. I don't get a penny out of that. And I spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but it's just just like the camp, you know. It's, uh, it's it's something I do because it's it's valuable. Uh, you know, it brings value to my my life, and it brings value hopefully to others because this is the way it brings value to my. And I want to talk like go full circle again. We're talking about training and how do you become a trainer and so on. I I have this theory that there are two kinds of people. There are the people who are motivated by their own achievements. And then there are people who are motivated by the achievements of others, meaning right. they like to help. Yeah. So it's basically it is the athlete and the trainer uh, in this in this scenario, and I am the trainer. It is my character, and I don't think because I care more about Sam's achievements in chess tournament that I care than I care about my own, and Sam cares about his own but doesn't care about mine at all I don't think that makes me a better person because me without Sam would be tragic Sam without me would also be a diminished figure um, and and I just think that uh, you know something like uh, the feeder trainers commission I didn't want that I wasn't you know I wasn't like I was asking for it uh, but I was approached and said by someone saying we are going to win the election um, we need someone to run this. Uh, the, the the main team, they have no idea about what to do here. They are looking to us to put something together. Will you do it? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I can maybe be a little part of it. Then they come back the next day. Will you do it? Will you do it? Eventually, I said yes. Hmm. And now I'm doing it. And I'm giving it a full swing. And uh, there are many problems and politics are complicated. Um, but hopefully, uh, over a few years, we will be able to to make a difference. And uh, long term, that could hopefully m mean that people coming to chess or people wanting to improve in chess um, will not steer away from FIDE, as has been the, the case for the last 30 years. Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, I mean, early signs are definitely, I know that you say there's uh, more problems to be fixed than there are then there is time and resources but i mean it's nice to see uh the mothership start to turn around um in terms of uh, the direction of fide absolutely yeah like i for example i'm um i don't agree with everything but at least you know people are are, are trying to find solutions to problems like the grand prix was very unattractive previously um and now they come up with this uh 16 player knockout I, th I think it's a very bad idea. Uh, I have my reasons. I don't think that... Uh, I agree with with Mikhail uh, Krasenkov that chess is deep thinking. And then rapid chess and blitz chess are chess-like games. And now we're going to see a situation where from the, the Swiss, we're going to have a, a rapid playoff for sure uh, most of the time. Uh, for the World Cup, uh, is rapid playoff all the time. And now this Grand Prix is also rapid playoff. And even the World Championship match was a rapid playoff. We have a situation where the classical chess World Championship is decided more and more by rapid. I don't like it. Um, but okay, I understand that, that other people think differently. And they have reacted to the problem of that it was not very attractive but i also want to point out that uh although i personally uh was very happy with it uh, that we know from experience that the 16 player knockout is not a good way to find the candidate for a world championship match it's quite clear that um, uh, the best player didn't win in kazan in 2011 um, even if, if he was my student. <laughs> uh, it was also not a, a very attractive uh, tournament at all uh, to follow. Um, so I, 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 I would 
expect that they would get disappointed if they'd asked for my opinion on this, which obviously they didn't because it's not in my area. I would have liked to have uh, 16 players in total in the Grand Prix, and then I would have uh, two double-rounded uh, uh, all-play-all tournaments I like, like the candidates. You know, we have this problem in modern chess with many draws. We saw it in the World Championship. We see it in the Grand Chess Tour. We see it in many top tournaments. And it's a structure, uh, structural problem of the, the tournaments. Like the World Championship, uh, Peter Heine Nielsen uh, released the statistics. I'm going to just going to trust him on it. That when uh, the players are even, then a decided game will happen at about 22% of the time. But if the, one of the players is in the lead, then a decisive game will happen about 44% of the time. So if you have a rapid playoff in advance, if you have a match where the challenger get an extra white but has to win, or, or one of many other uh, constructs where they are never tied, uh, you would solve this uh, problem we have seen in many, many uh, matches ever since they, they had to solve the problem of how to get Kramnik back into the uh, the cycle uh, w w without uh, giving the world champion to pile of draw odds. Uh, because even though Kramnik was the challenger and signed a contract with the challenger. Of course, he didn't recognize himself as a challenger, and they invented the playoff simply because they said there is no challenger here. And then they kept it. Um, so, you know, the, and with the Grand Chess Tour, we see quite clear structure where uh, the main objective for a lot of the players should be to qualify for next year. So you get uh, another four or six tournaments and, and a full year salary times two or three. Uh, just for, for playing these events. Um, so the main thing is uh, not to get uh, get killed a lot. And we have a player like Nakamura who wins a tour now uh, without winning a classical game. Uh, he played very well in the rapid, uh, but it's a different discipline as, as I see it. Um, but on the other hand, when you have the candidates tournament where there's only uh, one winner, then you get these amazing fighting games. There's nothing wrong with chess. It's not a drawish game. It's just if you make tournaments where where both players are, are rewarded for draw, you're going to get draws. Well, but I mean, just to push back a little bit, because I um, absolutely I I, uh, I come down a little more on the side of uh, presenting it. I mean, as a sports fan, I generally prefer decisive results. Obviously, I love chess and I appreciate its beauty. So it's not, you know, I'm. I'm looking at it as my own perspective is I can enjoy draws, but trying to look at it as a, a more casual fan, um, you know, like Alpha Zero and Stockfish in a thousand game match, they drew 839 of the games. Um, so chess kind of, it is, it's a draw is the most likely result. And as people continue to get better, that's only going to increase if they're playing um, classical games. That That's sort of my long-term concern is right now there are things we can do to stem the tide, but the tide is still moving in that direction. I, I, I don't agree. But, uh, you know, we, we, we will not know for a long time. Um, all we can do is we can make rules for the, uh, the current, and we've seen the candidates' tournament have been profoundly interesting each and every time. It was interesting when it was World Championship in 2005 and seven, and it has been interesting in 13 in what is it, 15, 16, and 18. They've always been interesting. Uh, so the all-play, all, all uh, double-rounded has brought us lots of interesting games all the time. Uh, as I mentioned this with the, 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 the decisive game in World Championship matches, uh, that if you don't have a situation where the players are tied, you get twice as many decisive games. Um, you know, I think rather than picking the game apart and uh, and you know when when are we going to introduce the dice it's uh, <laughs> you, you know it's uh, i understand that two and a half hours made more for 36 moves made sense when the opening theory ended much earlier and we didn't have computer preparation but if you look at vic and c um, there's lots of fighting chess there and uh, the opening is not really where the games are decided at all and and i don't teach opening by the way um, and it's, but it's not where where games are decided, and, and less and less so. And players still manage to outplay each other. But if there's no motivation to to take risks, 
you're not going to get uh, decisive results. Okay. I mean, you definitely make a good point about s- solving problems as they come. About, but, of, but of course, it ends down as a as a, a value thing. If you want it to be uh, more decisive results, but at, as the result of it just being it goes too fast, you know, then you could also make uh, Formula One more interesting by uh, putting oil out on the track and you'll have more, uh, um, let's say, fireworks. Right. But I, I just don't see that, uh, you know, as a, we also have a cultural heritage here. That this is chess and uh, I, I don't have a problem with rapid chess or blitz chess. Uh, but I disagree with someone like uh, Greg Shahad and say you don't really like chess. No, you you you, you know you, you like rapid and blitz. And nobody would play rapid and blitz. I like serious chess. I like to to sit and think uh, over positions, think think d- uh, deeply. Uh, yeah. And and lots and lots and lots of people do. I think it's the most popular uh, type of chess. We have in Scotland at least and in Denmark where, which is the country I know most of. We have lots and lots and lots of classical tournaments. We don't have many rapid and blitz tournaments and they are not that uh, that popular. Well, I was I was glad to hear that FIDE is they announced that they're polling top professionals about what their preferences are in terms of um uh time controls and um how to arrange things and of course to me that's the most important thing is that that the people competing in the events themselves um feel like no you i think you're just going to get a blatant self-interest except from maybe from carlson who thinks he will win in any format well but he has his preference he's pretty vocal about his preferences too sure um so one more question, if you don't mind, Jakob. I know Absolutely. we've I know we've gone long, but but what you our most recent line of discussion sort of dovetails into one of the the notes I sent you of something I might ask you about. Um, uh, that you mentioned the uh, five periods of chess um, in your writing, the early developments where which was like the the Roy Lopez the the person era, the Romantic period which was the Morphy era classical period which is Steinitz Tarash Capablanca modern era Botvinnik through Kasparov and then we have the digital period when computers start to take over and uh, well they don't take over it's, it's just they, they revealed a lot of things about how to play chess uh, people take far more chances now than they did previously um and I know what question is coming, but come with it anyway. Yeah. So just to, to complete the question is, so what do you think will come after the digital period? Um, yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, I am thinking... Uh, that uh, the the next the next step in in chess is uh, is uh, rather than Fisher random, which I think is a uh, uh, you know a, a little circus thing. Hmm. I think we will uh, we will encounter a, a form of chess where we have let's say we have a database of two thousand positions and then uh, you sit down to the game and then there's a, a digital wheel spinning and bang there you got your position huh. I, yeah, think that- that, I think that that also it's been another idea which has been mentioned is that uh, this year we start with the pawns on A3 and A6 next year we'll put them somewhere else I like these ideas Hey, it's, it's, uh, they're not new idea. The 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 spinning wheel. When I heard it through Kramnik, maybe it's his idea. Maybe it's someone else's idea. I sh- I should say in the interview with Kramnik, I I don't know him personally. Okay, that's interesting. Well, I I don't know when the next period will be, but um, hopefully, um, I mean it'll be interesting. I mean the the digital period is a, uh, it's it's progressive progressing rapidly with uh, with Alpha Zero uh you know pushing the boundaries of what we know about chess so well, i would think that alpha zero would get dismantled soon we had hydra at some point we had uh, deep blue and they just get dismantled and secrets are kept and yeah no it'll get dismantled but the fact that it's it's playing in such a different style uh suggests that uh i mean that's going to filter through to players um so i just feel like uh change is accelerating basically 
I think our understanding of chess has always been expanding. Um, I think if you take a, a top player from the 70s, um, his uh, practical skills would far exceed mine, uh, but his understanding of the game would, uh, would be quite poor compared to mine. Um, I should say that at, at my best uh, level, I was, uh, you know, I was was twenty five fifty, and I was definitely going up. And instead, I got kids, and I went down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it's quite a common thing. But it, it's not like um, I, I was maybe, you know, for a period I was playing like I was in the outskirts of top hundred. Uh, and it was a period over over more than a year. Um, but. Um, but but for sure I was was not going to get better than that. Uh, but I think uh, you know lower half of the the top ten in the seventies. You know I, I would think that my understanding is is better than theirs were at the time. Yeah, which is which is incredible, um, in one lifetime. Yeah, well, um, I, I I I think Sam would have good chances against Fisher. Wow. That would be interesting. That that'll set the internet on fire. People are arguing about that one, <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm, but, I'm, I'm, I'm you should probably delete that. <laughs> no, 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 keep it keep it keep it in. But uh, okay. you know, uh, I, I should say one thing is uh, sometimes online, you know, I just say what I think, and it doesn't mean that I mean that other people should agree with it. And you know, you agree with me here, and I, I don't mind. Uh, you know, I, it's fine. Your opinion is as valuable as mine. Um, you know, I say what I think. It doesn't mean that I'm arrogant. Sometimes, uh, you know, we have a, a block. You know, if people want to, to, to talk to us, we have a block on the Quality Chess uh, website where we read everything and we, we answer everything. And, uh, uh, you know, if people want to contact us, it's there. And sometimes, you know, I will write about things honestly, like why I don't like the Swiss system. And then I will give a context, and in that context, I, you know, people were were quite insulting to me, and I told them, you, you know, to um, go where the sun don't shine, basically. <laughs> and and then they were, uh, you know, they were saying I was very arrogant and I shouldn't talk to like that to people by by my books. And it's like, you know, if people are insulting me. And then you know I will, I will, I will, I will tell them that I don't appreciate it at all. Um, but uh, I don't think that uh, buying my books gives anyone a right to to insult me. On the other hand, if they want to question my thinking, I will I will uh, answer them in a in a respectful way of what I think, and I always uh, take what people think into consideration. Uh, and 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 that's the way you develop your thinking. I'm I'm always profoundly unsure about everything, and I want to stay unsure about everything. There's only one thing I'm certain of: that's uh, Sam Shanklin is going to get much much stronger. <laughs> nice, and we'll look forward to that. Um, yeah, and you mentioned the Quality Chess blog. I know that that's one way to reach you, and uh, you you guys are quite interactive there. So uh, encourage encourage listeners to read that. And if is there any other way? If uh, I mean, and just to Remind listeners. Oh, my, 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 my email is Okay, so we'll, we'll put your email address in there. And listeners, if anyone is able to go to this uh, Quality Chess Academy, I really encourage you to go. And if you do, maybe even give me a shout. Maybe we can uh, can do a little um, a little recap uh, here on Perpetual Chess like we did when Alex King went on the, the chess train. Um, because I would love to hear about it. It sounds amazing. And uh, yeah, I won't, I won't be making it this year, unfortunately. But uh, we do want this endeavor to thrive. Um, so, so Maybe yeah, you never know. I got to get my kid into chess. That's the, that's the main hook I need. Um, so, um, so thank you so much for your time, Jakob. This has been incredible. Uh, you're very welcome. And, um, yeah, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Special thanks to Matthew Passy, the esteemed producer of Perpetual Chess. I also want to thank Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music, and thanks to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it be via social media, positive reviews on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, or just telling a friend about the show. Every little bit helps the show grow consistently. But most of all, I want to thank people who 
chip in and help support the show financially. You guys have heard me say I put a lot of time and effort into this show between researching the guests, reading the books of the guests, lining up the guests, all the promotion online. It adds up to probably about five hours a week. I love the work, but it wouldn't be possible without financial support. So thank you most of all to Chessable.com. And I want to give thanks to the following individuals and entities for their generous support. Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Benjamin Handelman, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, I am Carlos Perdomo of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Woods, I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained. Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, Daniel Naylor, Daniel D. Schaefer, Daniel Viney, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Elect Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, I am Greg Shahadi. Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Augard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Banastia, James Millick, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jennifer Valens of OffTheRook.com, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jernigan, WGM Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Passi, Martin Habish, Matthew Tedesco, my main man, Moonmaster9000, Nate Solon, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paolo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalvo, Rob Lazorchek of DiplomatChess.com, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Ryan Stone, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, the law office of Stuart Katz, in case any of y'all are in legal trouble, uh, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Thomas Casper, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and the last person in the alphabet, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I will catch you all next week.